Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, things to come. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And I'm joined by my two regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, the world's only remaining full-time Beatles reporter. Um, who you can <laughs> read his work uh, in Billboard.com and Access, that's AXS.com, and uh, you name it, Variety, Hollywood Reporter. Mm-hmm. He's all over the place. Mm-hmm. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Hello, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, by the way. That was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a special guest today, uh, Vivek Tiwari, or I should say maybe Vivek J. Tiwari, <laughs> looking at the cover of the book, the author of The Fifth Beetle, The Brian Epstein Story. And um, we'll first just say hello, Vivek. Vivek, how are you doing? Hello. Okay. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Great. And Vivek is here because it is the... 50th anniversary of Brian Epstein's death, or I suppose in in Brian's case, it would be appropriate to say it's his 50th yard site. Um, it's a little <laughs> Yiddish thing there for you. So, uh, you know, 50, it's, it's kind of, in a way, almost surprising. I mean, for those of us who were there at the time <laughs> that it's 50 years, I mean, I remember it pretty vividly. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it was kind of shocking, you know, picking up the newspaper and, you know, Brian Epstein dead, you know. I mean, we sort of thought of him almost in the same way as the Beatles themselves. I mean, he was, he was as close to them as anybody could be. So, and, you know, Vivek wrote this book, this graphic novel, um, about Brian, and it's, um, I guess now at this point it's like four years old, but it seemed worth revisiting. And also, since Vivek has, in, in doing this, has researched Brian pretty thoroughly, it seemed like a good guy to have on, you know? <laughs> well, thank you. I'll do, I'll do my best to be enlightening. <laughs> okay. So, um, what, what led you to do this in the first place? What was it about Brian Epstein or the Brian Epstein story that drew you to wanting to do a book? Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm certainly a lifelong Beatles fan. You know, I, I joke that I've been listening to the Beatles since before I was born because my my parents uh, put the Beatles on and were, were listening to it in the house while my mom was pregnant. Um, unlike you guys, I was not there. I was born in '73, so I was born just a little bit too late. Um, so I'm in some ways what you could call a second generation Beatles fan. So the Beatles and their story. Um, you know, their the, their rise to success and kind of what they stand for and their impact was not something I watched grow, but was something that was all basically always a fait accompli from, you know, from when I was born, from the minute I was born. Mm-hmm. So so I um, found myself in business school in 1991 at the Wharton School of Business. I was on a track to join my my family business, which would have seen me selling food products or or working in the financial security sector um, to industries that I was not interested in whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and if I was, was not going to do those things, then I was expected, like many Indian kids my age who had some means and opportunity, I was expected to become a doctor or an engineer. Mm-hmm. But I didn't want to do any of those things. I grew up in New York City. I was exposed to the arts at a very young age. And I dreamed of working in the arts, in particular working in music. And, I, and uh, at Wharton in 1991, there were no resources for students who were interested in working in the, in the arts and entertainment industries. That's changed. The school has quite a, quite a good arts and media program now. But back then, it was all about investment banking and accounting and finance and the very traditional business fields. Mm-hmm. And so I thought I need to study this stuff on my own. And being a lifelong Beatles fan, I thought I should, uh, you know, the Beatles and, and Brian were the team that wrote and then rewrote the rules of the pop music business. Right. So I naturally thought I should study the business of the Beatles and study how Brian accomplished all the business things that he did. 
you know, so my initial interest was, you know, how did he get them a record deal when every label had passed? How did he convince George Martin to book them when every producer in the UK had passed? Mm -hmm. How did he get Ed Sullivan to book the Beatles in the US when a British band had never made an impact here? Mm -hmm. You know, these were the questions that I, I sought answers for. And I got those answers and they were inspiring and I, I was getting what I wanted. But ironically, what I was not interested in was elements of his personal life. But when I learned that he was gay mm -hmm. at a period when it was literally against the law, right. you know, he, here, here was an architect of the summer of love who had to literally hide his own love away. Mm -hmm. You know, when I learned those things and learned that he was Jewish at a time of pervasive anti-Semitism and learned that he was from Liverpool and prior to the Beatles, Liverpool is not New York City. You know, it's not a town that had any cultural influence. Mm -hmm. You know, so I realized Brian was in a lot of ways the ultimate outsider. And that's what was so inspiring to me. You know, you, you could see, you know, I, I figured if the gay Jewish kid from Liverpool, you know, he was 27 years old when he discovered the Beatles. You know, if that guy could uh, could discover the Beatles and bring the world the Beatles, then why couldn't a weirdo Indian kid from New York City <laughs> write graphic novels and produce Broadway musicals and do the things that I dreamed of doing? I see. Well, okay, you know, if you put it that way. Uh, you know, that, and, and that's it. That's the best way to put it. You know, the Brian Epstein story sure. inspired me to, to chase my dreams. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. What kind of source material did you have? I mean, obviously, there is Cellar Full of Noise. Um, when you were working on this, I don't know if Deborah Geller's book was out yet, was it? Were, were there that's places? Pretty, that's, pretty, that's pretty old. I think it was. Yeah. I think, yeah. So, I think... Yeah. I mean, it, it's an excellent question. You know, so, so um, a Cellar the, there were three books that were technically in print when I began this research, and that was Cellar Full of Noise. Um, Ray Coleman's uh, Brian Epstein, the man who made the Beatles, mm -hmm. and Debbie Geller's book that you're, you know, in my life. But all three of those books were out of print uh, when I when I was doing my research. Mm -hmm. And this is 1991, and in 91 there's no Wikipedia, there's no YouTube, there's no Google, you know. And so there are none of these resources we take for granted, and there are no used book websites where you could find any, and, you know, today you can find any any one of those three books I just mentioned quite easily on Amazon Marketplace or Abe Books or anything like that. But when I was doing this research, I, I didn't have that, that those, uh, those opportunities, you know. Mm -hmm. I went to the Strand Bookstore in New York City where I live and I went to their rare books room and did a search for the Ray Coleman book and it showed up four months later. It was like, you know, I felt like I was a detective really just trying to, to uncover this information. And no question those books were helpful. But the truth of the story is I, I did most of my research through interviews. Right. You know, I, I read all the respected Beatles books I could get my hands on, and I would read, you know, 300, 400 page books about the Beatles that would have 10 or 15 decent pages about Brian. Mm -hmm. But through that research, I, I learned, you know, who were the people who knew him best? People like Nat Weiss, sure. um, you know, who was his close confidant and the Beatles U.S. attorney, Sid Bernstein, the legendary concert promoter. And, you know, and I focused on, on tracking down on, on names of people who lived within driving distance of New York or Philadelphia, you know, which was home and school. And then I just cold called these people and I, I asked them whether they would talk to me. And, and that's really how I did my research was by, by interviewing people. Mm -hmm. You know, there weren't that many books and I couldn't find the books that were that existed. And to be quite honest, you know, the, the, the books only had a limited amount of useful information about Brian. Sure. You know, it's, uh, it, it was really through just interviewing people who knew him and becoming friends with them that, um, that I was able to, to source my information. And, and that latter point about becoming friends was, was really quite critical because the first few meetings I had with these folks were about the business. And, I, and as I said, I learned those business stories that I was chasing. But it was only until, like, you know, I, I became, you know, close with these people in, in, a, in a friendly way that they started opening up to me and telling me stories about Brian's personal life. And that's the parts – those are the parts that I found truly inspiring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you get to see any correspondence? I mean, I saw endless. I mean, you know, I've been I've been doing this research for 25 years now. So mm -hmm. at this point, yeah, it's you know, you know, lots of, of of letters and contracts, and certainly, you know, a ton of, of paperwork and materials. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I but but I would say that you know, the heart of 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 the research that I did, or certainly what turned me on to the story, was not so much written documents as it was just you know conversations with living, breathing people. Mm -hmm. But there's no question over the years, I, I've seen a tremendous amount of of paperwork. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we do is we go around the you know the panel and um, we each grill you. So uh, <laughs> should we move on to who wants to be next? Uh, I'll do it. Okay, I volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. 
off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly when Queenie Epstein and Clive Epstein passed away, but did you contact them at all? Were you able to, and were they cooperative, either yeah. one of them? Unfortunately, I, I was not able to uh, to contact either of them before they passed. So, you know, the only really surviving members of the Epstein family are the, the nieces and nephews. And um, the eldest, Joanne, you know, was four when Brian died. Um, mm. So she didn't have, uh, you know, any any real memories of her of her uncle, um, although she was able to you know tell me a lot of stories about Brian's mom, about her grandma. Um, you know, who she was very close with and loved very dearly. So unfortunately, I never was able to talk to Queenie directly, but I, I did uh, hear a lot about her um, through her grandchildren. Okay. And when did Clive pass away? You know, I can't remember the exact year. He he may have been alive when I started to do my research, um, but he certainly uh, wasn't alive for, you know, when I was knee deep in it. Um, mm-hmm. But, I, you know, I, I don't know off the top of my head when he died. And based on all the interviews that you did for your research, what did you, know, you uncover? Uh, you know, this, this is the beauty of the internet. I'm just pulling it up now. He died in, in uh, 1988, so, okay. so he, he died before I was able to, to do any. You know, before I was knee deep in this stuff. Right. So unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I was not able to talk to him. Okay. What well, What did you learn from interviewing all these people when when doing this research that you didn't know before? Whether it's his personal life or what he did in business. Well, I mean, you know, the, the most to me, the most enlightening stuff was that were these aspects of his personal life and, and how it, it was in such um, contrast to a lot of the preconceived notions I had about the history. And, and again, I wasn't there. You know, I was born in 73. So we mm-hmm. talked a few minutes ago about like the, the summer of love. You know, it's 19. 19- 17, I mean, it's, uh, it's 2017 now and we're celebrating or, or mem- remembering the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love this summer. It was 50 years ago today that, that there was the Summer of Love. And, you know, it, for somebody like me who didn't live through it, I, I think of it, you know, as, as, oh, it was a period of free love and openness and tolerance and mm. how wonderful that must have been. And, you know, by talking to, to people who, who knew Brian during that period, it's like, yeah, you know, he, he really helped to put that together by, by, by orchestrating Sgt. Pepper and marketing it and, and being, being part of that whole summer. But, you know, for people in the LGBTQ community, there was no summer of love at all. You know, you had to spend your summer indoors in the closet or right. risk getting sunburned. You know, and, and that was, was quite shocking to me, you know, to think of this era as being one that I imagined was an era of tolerance. But, you know, it was it was a summer of love if you had the right kind of love, which isn't really tolerance at all, is it? You know, mm-hmm. no. to say everything is OK, except for these three or four things, you know. Uh, so, right. so, you know, trying to, you know, putting that in perspective of, of a guy who spent his entire adult life um, helping the Beatles spread their message of love and tolerance and belonging around the world was really uh, it was it, it shifted everything that I that I thought about about that history and that this period. So I would say that's the stuff that was really most impactful to me. I mean, certainly there were timing things about, you know, how he negotiated this deal and how this happened before that. And, you know, that was fascinating from a historical perspective. But it was really these larger sort of cultural uh, issues and human issues that really, uh, I think, were most impactful to me and certainly most inspired me to keep chasing this story. You know, if I, in an ironic way, if I was, if, if uh, you know, Wikipedia and, and YouTube and, and Google had existed in, in the day I began my research, I probably would have found out all the, the specific Beatles details I was in chasing and then I would have dropped the subject and moved on. Um, mm. But by having by digging deep and learning about his personal life, the the stuff that I was really not interested in when I began my research, that's what would really open my eyes. Well, how much of your book deals with the personal side? Well, the Fifth Beetle is, is uh, you know, I mean, you'll have to read it and tell me. But if I've done my job correctly, I would say most of it is about that. I mean, it's it's a it's a short book. It's a 128 page graphic novel, and I did that on purpose because I wanted people to feel that they could pick it up and read it quite quickly. Um, you know, I kept thinking of the airport bookstore. You know, you might pick up this book in an airport bookstore. You're not a Beatles fan. You're not a huge graphic novel fan. But the art is beautiful. I'm not patting myself on the shoulder. I'm the writer, not the artist. But the art's really quite gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's $15. It's an interesting subject. And you think you could read this 
by the time your flight lands, no matter, you know, or, or by, but the, by the time most flights land, you know, and that's what I was trying to accomplish there. Um, so it does it, uh, delve quite deeply into his personal life. I mean, if I did my job correctly, what, what I did is really use the Beatles in, in sort of like a Trojan horse. You know, the Beatles is what draw, draws you into the story. It's what drew me into the story. But you wind up walking away with an inspiring human story. You know, we're adapting it into television right now. And, um, you know, when I think of the, the, the you know, it, it on, on camera, you know, we, our touchstones are, are not music related biopics. They're, they're shows like Rocky and Billy Elliot and, you know, uh, films that, that, you know, you don't you know, just like you don't need to love boxing to uh, to appreciate the Rocky films. And you certainly don't need to be a ballet fan to love Billy Elliot. You know, we're really designing this in such a way that you shouldn't need to be a Beatles fan to love the fifth Beatle book or certainly the, the forthcoming TV series. It's a huge bonus and it'll be, mm. you know, particularly meaningful to people who are huge Beatles fans. But this should be for anyone who's um, who's interested in inspiring human stories. Mm -hmm. That's that's interesting. It's really focusing really on Brian, the man more than Brian, the manager. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, 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 again, if I've done my job correctly, once you've finished reading the book or, or you know, what this, the, I keep mentioning the forthcoming TV series, what we're trying to do there is that, you know, we do expect, I mean, as I said, it was, it's my story as well, that most people who will, you know, crack the seams on the book or tune in for the television show are interested in the business of the Beatles. So we hope that we'll cover that ground as well so that people won't walk away feeling cheated, you know, that they'll think, okay, I, I learned the, the origin of the Beatles that I was chasing, but even more so, I I got this deep, inspiring human story that I didn't know was there. So, to, you know, on one hand, yes, it, it, you know, it's definitely really about Brian the man. But I hesitate to say more so than Brian the manager. I mean, if we've done our job correctly, it's about both. But the story that's truly important to me and the one that I think is really Im an important story because it's the one that will inspire people is less the story about Brian the manager and it's more the story about Brian the man. Mm. Okay. Steve, I, I got a whole, a whole sort, of, all sorts of questions. Uh, Vivek, let me first start off with the TV movie. Um, yeah. What's the status of the TV movie, um, and have there been any recent developments? Yeah, so so we're we are uh, developing the Fifth Beetle. We're adapting it into a, a television event series. Um, the current plan is that it will be six one-hour episodes. So in total, it'll be six hours. Um, it may wind up being more than that, but I think uh, I think it'll be at least six. We have uh, done a deal with a television financing and production company called Sonar Entertainment um, that have done a number of shows. Their two most recent shows are Mr. Mercedes, the Stephen King adaptation on the Audience Network, and um, FX's Taboo, the Tom Hardy thriller about mm -hmm. the early days of the Dutch East India Company. I think it's a joint production, actually, between FX and the BBC. Right. Uh, so, you know, so they, they handle, um, you know, conceptual work, so they're familiar with fanboy friendly work, if you will, you know, so they so they get the excitement of the graphic novel and some of the um, the fanciful treatments that I have, but they're also knee deep in, in period. Um, so they really kind of understand the space that this exists in. They I'm writing the, the, the scripts myself. So I wrote a pilot script uh, commissioned by Sonar and they greenlit that recently, which I'm very proud of. Um, I oh, actually good. just congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I, was, I actually uh, gave the, the fans at the Fest for Beatles fans of this uh, in Chicago a few weeks ago a sneak peek. So I was able to to read. Sonar gave me the permission to read the script aloud. So I, I did a script reading mm. um, at the uh, at the fest. So um, so the fans could get a sense of, of that. And I was proud to say we got a standing ovation. So that was very exciting. Wow! <laughs> and right now we are casting. Um, we have literally cast Brian Epstein. I, I, I can't unfortunately tell you who it is just yet. Brian was 32 when he died, so I will say it is a age-appropriate British actor of note. Uh, and because this guy is uh, well known, you know, we just want to be, be careful about how and when we announce, so that we, um, you know, get some some good press out of that. Uh, but we should be announcing uh, within the next few months. Okay. So it's sort of gone to that very uh, exciting place where we're already, uh, you know, casting the lead and and um, and looking at uh, those kind of creative elements. And we have sim are simultaneously out to the networks. Um, so Sonar and I have sent it to a, a number of networks, and I'm happy to report that we're getting interest from from all the, the different types of networks that exist, both high-end cable, 
um, traditional broadcast and the streamcasters as well. So we're not quite sure what um, what combination of networks it's going to be, but uh, but we are getting interest from all quarters. So so there should be a a very interesting package to announce in the next coming months. Cool. Uh, and and you did get mu- you got music license uh, as I recall. Indeed, yeah. I probably, I probably should have started by saying that, but um, but yes, perhaps the the most important and exciting you know element of this project as it's adapted to television is that we have the approval of the Beatles, meaning Paul, Ringo, Yoko Ono, and Olivia Harrison all signed off on the project, which uh, which led to a, a communications with Jeff Jones and approval from Apple Corps, which then let us do a deal with Sony ATV, who control the music publishing, which is all a very long-winded and technical way of saying we have unprecedented access to Beatles music for the piece. It's literally the first and only time the band has given uh, complete access to their catalog for a non-documentary. So we're very, very proud of that. So there will, uh, you know, one major difference from the book is that, you know, in, in a book we had a limited number of music scenes. Um, I think my artist did a tremendous job of making those pages look like they were singing, but obviously they weren't. So, uh, so in the in the uh, television series, we're going to have a lot of music sequences because we have access to this wonderful catalog. Let's make it clear that this is not going to be an animated film. This is going to be live action, correct? That is correct. Thank you for for. Uh, for clarifying that, it is going to be a live action project. Those of you who've read The Fifth Beatle know that uh, the book does have quite a number of fantasy sequences, uh, you know, mm-hmm. dream sequences, hallucination sequences. Um, you know, it, it the moves in time period from 61 to 67, so it also covers the birth of the psychedelic era. So we're trying to have, uh, you know, the form of the piece uh, mirror that. You know, as you get deeper into the book, you see the, the artwork becomes uh, significantly more psychedelic as the psychedelic era descends. And so we intend to play around with um, with those uh, styles in the television series as well. So there will likely be sequences that that are animated, but it is going to be a you know dream sequences, hallucination sequences, etc. But it's going it is going to be a live action piece. Mm-hmm. As much as you can, and I mean, I know you're limited in what you can say. How does the story in the book and the movie, which I which I'm guessing is going to be you know, as you've been saying, it's going to be a little different. How does it compare with other books and plays on Brian Epstein? I mean, besides the the, the ones we mentioned, there's been the plays in, in the UK. Uh, how does The Fifth Beatle take a different approach to Brian's life at all? Well, you know, I, I haven't seen the play in the UK, so I, I can't really comment on that. I, I know those producers, and I like them very much. And, um, you know, my understanding of how they think and treat Brian is similar to what I feel, but I haven't seen the work, the work, so I actually shouldn't comment on it. Mm-hmm. You know, compared to the the books that exist on Brian, you know, I think this goes back to what we were discussing earlier. Like, I, I you know, I hope that my piece will certainly leave Beatles fans happy with with learning some of the the behind the scenes business stuff of the Beatles. But it's really not about that. And and I think most of the books that have existed on Brian, few as they are, have really focused on the Beatles. You know, it's the Beatles of it all. And and. And what I'm trying to do is get into what I think is the heart of the man, what made him tick. Why, why did a guy who had to literally keep his, his sexuality in check pick a career for himself that, that constantly put him in the public eye? You know, every, every achievement that he was able to secure for the Beatles made him, his own life, more and more uh, uh, dangerous. Um, right. You know, so that that kind of stuff is fascinating to me. And so I, I, I personally don't think any other treatment of Brian has really focused on on that area of his life. And as I said, that to me is the most inspiring. That to me is the the area of Brian's life that, that in the end, the message is no dream is too impossible and no person too unlikely to realize that dream. Hmm. And that's a universal message, you know. Mm-hmm. The thought of doing a, a, a graphic novel it was kind of uh, surprising to me when you first announced it because, I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do with a comic book. and uh, I mean, with a, a comic, with a treatment like that, especially with artistic license. Do you agree with that? Or why did you decide to go with a graphic novel as opposed to uh, just a regular book, a regular biography? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, well, for, I mean, you know, the, the easiest answer to your question is I'm a massive comic fan, you know, mm-hmm. ever since I, 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 I <laughs> think that I learned to read by reading comics. My earliest memories of reading are sitting on my mother's lap reading Tintin books. Um, so, you know, I just, I just love the medium. And I, and I think that there's a, uh, you know, it's a tremendous medium for both um, conveying facts and conveying poetry. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's art, it's art meets words. Um, so I, that's, that's, 
that's the the quick and easy answer to your question. But I, you know, I, I did, um, you know, I, I wanted to, as I've been saying, sort of capture the poetry of the Brian Epstein story is, was more important to me than capturing the facts. I mean, the facts are important too. And, and, uh, you know, there, there are moments of artistic license, but for the most part, the facts are, are true in the fifth needle. And, uh, and when we deviate, uh, you know, we deviate for creative reasons that are, that I'm very, very aware of. Um, so I've certainly done my research and, and, you know, making sure that I'm true to the history, but I wanted, I, I was more important for me to get into this guy's mind and how he felt and what, what these developments meant for him. And I believe the best way to do that is really through art. You know, graphic novels that that um, that exist in the historical space, and, and the Fifth Beetle isn't the only one. They're not they're not a ton of them, but you're seeing more and more of them every year. You know, one one of the things that they, they sort of exist in this in this place that the way the way I look at it is, is you're sort of somewhere between a book and a film. You know, uh, you know, in a film, you expect a certain degree of creative licensing to be taken with telling somebody's life. You know, and my understanding of uh, the Johnny Cash story and Walk the Line is that he didn't propose, uh, you know, on stage in the middle of a live concert, but that was kind of how it felt to him. He was so in the public eye that when he did decide to propose, it felt like all eyes were on him, you know, <laughs> and that was a wonderful dramatic scene in the movie. It was a great scene. So, and people were okay with that. I don't remember hearing a lot of controversy around that scene. And uh, so you can get away with things like that in a film. And with a graphic novel, you have a little bit of that, but it's also a book, right? And people say, you know, I read it in the book, and if it's in the book, it's got to be real. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of that sense to a book. So the graphic novel is somewhere in between. You know, people people take it a little bit more seriously, like it's a real biography, but also allow you to have a little bit of creative license with the understanding that you're trying to tell, you're trying to get into the poetry of it all. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, was was why why the graphic novel made perfect sense because I wanted to do both of those things. Okay. You know, I, I one I'll say one quick thing. You know, so much has been written about the night that Brian went to the Cavern Club to see the Beatles, you know, and right. taking myself totally out of the out of the, the conversation. If you look at the three pages that that happens in the fifth Beatle, and I say I take myself out because there's very little writing in those pages. It's mostly art. I would argue that the fifth Beatle captures that night for Brian better than any book that's ever been written on the Beatles. You mm -hmm. just see the look on his face and the sense of hope and possibility and opportunity that he sees in the Beatles. I believe that's captured through the medium of graphic novels better than you could in any prose biography. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at those pages now. That last question, are you going to do anything else with the book? Um, are you going to reissue it or you know expand it maybe? Yeah, there's no there's no plans for that right now. I mean, we just in uh, in December 2016 released it in paperback, um, which was uh, which was long long uh, over long waited for. You know, it's a now it's fifteen dollars. It's a very affordable price. There were some expanded materials in that. Um, you know, subsequent to the book's first publishing, Brian was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and um, to the Rock Hall's immense uh, credit. They they called me and they said, you know, we know he belongs in the Rock Hall, but we don't know enough about him. Will you help us? Will you consult with us on this? And so I was able to do that. So I wrote an essay about my experiences on that. So, you know, there were a couple different essays and, and material that's in the, that expanded edition that weren't in the, um, the original edition because it was material that, that didn't exist uh, when the book first came out. You know, once the television series is up and running, you know, we'll discuss whether it makes sense to put out another edition if there's enough new material. Um, you know, I try to, because I am a, a fan myself, I try to be very cognizant of not milking the fans for money, you know? I don't know that we need another edition of this book right now. You know, maybe we will in two or three years. But right now, I think the paperback is kind of all that's quote-unquote needed. But the television show really is going to get into a lot of other territory, you know, because because I have a six hour palette to play with, you know, it's not going to be short the way the book, as I mentioned earlier, I designed it to be short, to be a quick read, you know, so it's literally impossible to, to take that book and ju just, just with the material that's in the book, get six hours, you know, so there, the Pete Best story is going to be a big part of, of the pilot episode. Mm -hmm. Pete Best story is not delved into in the graphic novel. No. You know, Brian's relationship with his parents is going to be a much deeper part of the, um, of the television series than it was in the book. So there's a number of things that, uh, that, that I'm very excited to do with the TV series. So I'm really focused more on that these days than, than on expanding the book in any way. Okay. Uh, Alan, back to you. Okay. So um, you talked a little bit about creative license and also about the aspect of the book as, in, in a way, a, a piece of art rather than 
a straight bio. And in terms of creative license, I guess the thing that jumps out most is the character of Moxie. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, what, what, what led you to um, – to have her in there, seeing as that she didn't really, you know, exist, and he and he did have a personal assistant who was a male. Yeah, I mean, Moxie. You know, I don't want to give away too much about this for people who uh, who haven't read the book, but Moxie is a is a conflation of four uh, real life assistants. So mm-hmm. I, I assume you're mostly referring to Alistair Taylor, mostly, um, and she. And she is one part Alistair Taylor. Um, she's also one part uh, Peter Brown, another male assistant. Mm-hmm. She's one part Wendy Hansen. Mm. And uh, and she is mostly, I should say, Joanne Newfield. Then those were the two female assistants that Brian had. Joanne Newfield is now Joanne Peterson. She's married. Mm-hmm. Um, and she is uh, she lives in Australia. And she was, was very much um, involved in kind of helping me craft the character of Moxie. Um, but, you know, literally everything that Moxie does sees, feels, et cetera, is, is based on, on something that one of those four people did, saw, or felt. And primarily Joanne, you know, Joanne, well, I'm not telling you anything she wouldn't herself. You know, she saw Brian as, a, as a, you know, everything, a man, a man should be older, smart, well-dressed. And, you know, he took her to a ball one evening when he couldn't bring, you know, a boyfriend because it was illegal. So he, he brought his his young female assistant to, uh, you know, and it was the greatest night of her life. And, you know, that sequence is in the book. So she, so she is a conflation of, of four real life people, which is, you know, a device you see quite regularly in film. And, you know, sure. so this is another area where you, you can, you know, do those kind of things the way you couldn't in a, in a biography. Um, but she is actually, you know, yes, there are elements of, of Alistair Taylor in there, but she really is most closely drawn from, from a female assistant. And, uh, and there are a number of reasons why I chose that partially as brevity. You know, again, you know, if I wanted to build Alistair and Peter and Wendy and Joanne all into the story, the book would have been much bigger and would have become a little bit more for Beatles fans. Um, and as I said, I, I, I wanted to reach people who, who might not care about the Beatles that much, who might not read a book about the Beatles manager. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, you know, it takes a pretty significant Beatles fan to say, I'm going to pick up a book, not just about the Beatles, but about their manager, you know, right. um, but somebody who, who loves inspiring human stories is going to tune in uh, to see, um, you know, a beautiful mind, even if you don't could care less about math, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and that's really what I was interested in here. So that was one of the reasons. There's a number of others that I'd, I'd rather not get into because they get into spoiler territory. Okay. Uh, but there were, you know, I was very conscious about, you know, I, I will say on, for, for this, you know, we're, we're talking about this is we're on a Beatles podcast. I, I should say that even though Moxie is a made up character, there is nothing that she does, says or feels that didn't actually happen to one of Brian's assistants. Hmm. So even the, the, the made up character of Moxie is grounded in pretty significant historical research. Interesting. I don't know if it's something you want to talk about or if it gets into spoiler territory, but reading it, uh, my impression was that, I mean, I could never tell whether Moxie actually knew and understood <laughs> that he was gay. You know, I mean, she seemed, there seems to be some sort of tension there where, like, she, yeah. she seems to feel almost romantically towards him. Yeah, you know, and, and, and this is, um, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, it's, it's complicated, but I, I think that, um, that again, I was trying to be, I, I, you know, I'm just trying not to put too many words in, into Joanne's mouth, who I mostly, you know, base this off of. And, and it was the kind of thing where, you know, you know, but you kind of don't want to admit it, you know, you, because yeah. you have a crush on someone, yeah. uh, you know, it's, so it's, it's, so it's a bit complicated. And I hope that I've created that sort of tension in Moxie that like, she kind of knows, but maybe she does not admitting it to herself, or maybe she doesn't know, or, you know, yeah. and I think that's, and I think that's very human. You know, I think that that's, that's, um, it's very human to know something, but not want to admit it to yourself when you have romantic feelings about something, you know? Right. So, um, so you're, you're touching on something that, that is accurate and that I tried to play with. And again, if I did my job uh, correctly, it'll be more, the end result is, is emotional and not confusing, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that is something that, um, that I tried to capture that, that sort of balance. Yeah. So since we also have you here, you know, not just to talk about the book and the, the TV series, but to reflect on Brian, um, which I guess you, you had been doing all along, but you know, what was it, do you think, that 
you know, in the same way that George Martin was the perfect person to produce their records, there was something about Brian being the perfect person to, you know, get them out of Liverpool, get them into something. I mean, I don't think Alan Williams could have done it, important as he was, you know, in, in getting them to Hamburg, which, you know, as Mark Lewison said, if no Alan Williams, no Hamburg, no Hamburg, no Beatles. But still, Brian was the one that, like, kicked it over the goal. So what was it, do you think, that made that possible? Yeah, I mean, I think the, on the broadest level, it's the fact that Brian had, uh, you know, undying love and faith in the band, um, mm-hmm. and he had true vision. You know, the, I, um, and I'll start with the vision. You know, in, in the early days, Brian, when Brian first saw the Beatles, he said, the Beatles are going to be bigger than Elvis, you know, and that's a very famous quote. And at the time, that was crazy that you couldn't possibly imagine anyone being, being bigger than Elvis. But he really believed that and everybody laughed at him until he proved it right. Mm-hmm. You know, the other thing he said in those early days that's less that he's less famous for, because it's a little harder to understand, is that the Beatles are going to elevate pop music into an art form. Hmm. You know, and people with that one, they didn't so much laugh at him as scratch, scratch their heads and be right. like, what, what is he even talking about? You know, and then six years later in 1967, you know, he pointed at Sgt. Peppers and he said, that's what I was talking about. You know, and, and especially in particular, uh, a day in life. You know, that he said that that's the song that kind of that turned all the rules of of a, what could, what a pop song is on its head. You know, all of a sudden, pop music is not just you know disposable silly songs that are pop, hot one year and might be forgotten in two or three years, um, but they're songs that that will stand the test of time. And that's really visionary. You know, I mean, for all the, their ambitions and their faith in themselves. I don't think any of the Beatles believed that they were going to elevate pop music into an art form in 1961. You know, (laughs) in some of his most arrogant moments, John might have thought that I could do what Elvis is doing. But I don't think John ever said, I'm going to be as as legendary and timeless as Beethoven. You know, but that's but that's exactly what Brian was saying. You know, Brian was a fan of jazz and classical. You know, he wasn't even a fan of pop music. Right. And he saw the Beatles in the same light as the great past classical composers that he loved. Mm-hmm. Like here we are 50 years later, you know, celebrating some of these records like Sgt. Pepper's like that wouldn't have have, uh, have impressed Brian. You know, Brian would say, you know, come back to me in 300 years, uh, you know, when they're when you're still celebrating the Beatles, then I'll say I told you so, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, and it's that kind of vision and doing and building all the business around that vision you know, to allow that vision that I think is really special for Brian. I don't think any other human being, forget about any other manager, could have done that for the Beatles in in 1961. And then the other side is really love and faith. You know, he had the ultimate faith in the band and and he loved them, I I would argue, like children. You know, he often called the Beatles his boys. And um, over the years, uh, you know, salacious, scandal-seeking journalists have, have suggested that that's because he was gay and he wanted to jump into bed with them. You know, I think the truth of the matter is, is a little simpler, but on the same hand, far more more textured and complicated, is that they were the children that he would never have. They were like his boys. You know, he was a gay man in the 60s, and he knew he was never going to get married and have kids. And these were were like children. Now, I don't want to take that analogy too far, but I think there's there's certain elements of it that, that are accurate. And, mm-hmm. and like, like any good father, Father, you know, you have unconditional love for your children. You know, no matter no matter what they do, you're going to love them and support them. And like any good father, you'll move mountains in the service of your children's dreams. And that was Brian. He would do anything to realize the success and the dreams of the Beatles and his own vision for elevating pop music into an art form. Mm-hmm. And I think that other managers would have given up after a while or would have done, you know, some of the things that the record labels did, you know, when, when the would have wanted, you know, when the labels didn't want the Beatles to stop touring and, and experiment with Eastern instrumentation. They wanted more hits, radio singles. You know, these guys were a boy band. They were one direction. They were in sync. You know, and when when bands are at that level, you put out a Christmas record, you put out a ho- other holiday albums, you tour the world, you cash in because these things don't last. Mm-hmm. But Brian didn't do that. There weren't 100 greatest hits records. There weren't holiday Christmas albums. You know, there were some of those things after the band disbanded. Now we have a number of compilation records, but we didn't certainly in the UK where he had the control. There weren't those, the, uh, you know, a million greatest hits records. And Brian was was carving a, a vision for the band and, and, had, and he did that because he had faith in them. Mm-hmm. So, so I would say on, on the broadest level, those are the most important things he, he, he had that no one else had that he gave the Beatles. Mm-hmm. So in, in one of those elements that, that to sort of tease out of what the, the last bit that you just said was a, sort of a sense of style that regular old experienced managers didn't have. 
you know, they, yeah. 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 So, and, and that, um, you know, and, and yeah. I, w- I would argue that that, that that sense of style um, that we're getting at here also plays into his homosexuality. You know, I think that Brian as a gay man could see how, you know, if packaged and presented in the right way, this band would appeal to girls, to boys, to parents, to everyone, you know, in a way that, you know, a straight British manager of the 1960s might not have seen Mm -hmm. how these four guys could appeal to guys and girls. You know, it's like you pick one, right? You know, but, but, but Brian could really see uh, both sides to things. And, and he had a, a clear sense of fashion, you know, and, and, you know, he was, a, he tried his hand at fashion designing and, and was very into theater. And, you know, he had a certain theatricality and, and vision for fashion that was just part of who he was. And, uh, you know, that plus this, this ability to have a big vision for the band, I think is what led to his work with them on image and style and, and all that sort of stuff. So in a way, it's, it's to go from the sublime to the ridiculous, you could almost see a, a, an episode of um, when they were, say, in Liverpool sharing a flat and being a mess, have a sort of Liverpool edition of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy with Brian coming in and, <laughs> and turning them into, like, you know... <laughs> I mean, it's not that, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's funny the way you, when you put it that way, but it's not far off from the truth, you know? No, no. And, and when Brian first dug in with the Beatles, they were kids, you know, and they, they were eager for success. They were more than happy to listen to, to the things that Brian suggested, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, uh, so, so you're, you're not totally off the mark there, you know? You're right. So on to Ken then. <laughs> Wow, these observations are blowing me away (laughs) of what you're saying about Brian. It's interesting what you said about Brian thinking of them as his kids, because when you get down to it, he was only six years older than John. He wasn't that much older. He couldn't really – he couldn't think of himself as a father figure. Well, really? Brian. Yeah, I, although I, you know, and, and like, the, look, this is this is where I, you know, as I said, I don't want I don't want to get too carried away with the analogy. It's not a perfect analogy, but I I would say that you know, for somebody like Brian who didn't get to do all the things that normal kids did, in large part because he was gay, the difference between you know being in your early thirties and being in your twenties is significant. You know, maybe the difference between being you know in your late thirties and your mid thirties isn't so significant, but but the six year difference of which this was a difference of, of a Liverpool boy, a Liverpool youth was quite significant. And Brian was kind of an old soul also. I mean, I, mean, I think he, he, he certainly didn't look or carry himself like he was in his late twenties or early thirties. I mean, if you look at those old videos, most people would be like, really, he was only 32. Mm. Um, so, so, you know, you, you bring up a very good point and, and I will start by saying it's part of where my analogy falls apart. You know, it's not a perfect analogy and I, and I don't want to get too carried away with it. But, but I do also think that the six year difference is, is quite meaningful um, when you're talking about the difference between, you know, 26 and 21. You know, that's a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, he carried himself off in a very dignified way, much like, you know, George Martin did. Absolutely. George Martin wasn't that much older than the Beatles. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that, that George and Brian bonded over was was their sophistication. You know, George mm-hmm. similarly was a huge fan of classical music. You know, I mean, Brian, I mean, he, he George has said it often that, that he, you know, he a large part of why he came to the Beatles was that he was taken by Brian. You know, he, he had he uh, there was something about their manager that, that he liked and saw kindred spirit in Brian. And um, so that it's not a coincidence at all. I think it's it's a key part of the story. Yeah, you had mentioned Pete Best earlier. How how much do you go into how difficult it must have been for Brian to be, you know, responsible for sacking Pete Best? Yeah, in in the book, uh, the answer is not at all, um, and in the television series, the answer is it's quite significant in, in the pilot episode. And um, you know, it's it's one of those things. I will be honest, like that. I, I uh, it was a decision I made with the book. You know, I wanted, as I said earlier, to keep it to 120, 130 pages. And you just couldn't tell all the stories. And I was like, you know, if you telling the Beatles story and leaving out Pete Best is would be irresponsible. You know, telling the Brian Epstein story and leaving out Pete Best 
maybe that's not irresponsible. Maybe that's something I can get away with. Maybe, you know, to this day, I'm not sure, you know, like maybe I should have had him in the book, but it is what it is. It's a decision I made and, and there you have it, you know, but, um, but in the television show where, where you have six hours, and I will say, this is also something I'm excited about doing it as a TV show instead of as a film, because in, in film, you know, it's a basic screenwriting premise that you, you can't have a major character in the first, you know, quarter of the story, uh, unless they die, who then just disappears and for the rest of the piece. But you can certainly do that in a, in a limited series. Um, that happens all the time in limited series. So Pete Best is a major character in episode one, but his story is told over the course of episode one. And then, you know, he doesn't appear in the rest of the series. Um, yeah. but, he, but the Pete Best story is going to be quite, quite critical. And quite frankly, I do think it is critical to the Brian Epstein story. And, and to this day, I'm not sure I made the right decision about the book, you know, but it, that was the decision I made at the time with the graphic novel. And also, how much do you go into Brian's attraction for John? Quite a bit, and you know, I, I would say that we um, we deal with that uh, in the book a good amount, and, and quite quite, and, and we will deal deal with it quite a bit more in um, in the television series. Again, just because we have a, a broader palette for it, you know, I I believe that um, that his attraction for all the Beatles, but in particular for John, was again critical in in helping him share, shape his vision. I don't think that that his attraction for for the Beatles and for John was equated with his wanting to hop into bed with him. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've always found it a little bit ridiculous that people think one naturally leads to the other. You know, I worked extensively in the music industry before I started my own company. I worked for Mercury Records. I worked for Sony before that. I worked with a lot of very sexy, attractive female musicians and, and others. Um, I'm a heterosexual male. And just because the, I was working very closely with a sexy girl didn't mean I was going to flirt with her and try to pop into bed with her and cheat on my girlfriend or have an affair on my wife because, I, you know, I mean, it's just, but that doesn't mean I didn't, wasn't attracted to the person sitting across the table from me. And I believe it was the same thing with Brian. You know, quite frankly, if his goal was to hop into bed with the Beatles, the, the very last thing that I think he would have done would have been offered to manage them. I think he would have found other ways to, to, to test the waters there other than saying, like, let me manage your career. So, yes, we get into it quite a bit. But, uh, you know, I personally believe it's more in how it helped shape his vision than in, than in some sort of scandalous, uh, you know, gay romance. Um, but there is tension around that. We deal with the with the lost weekend in Spain. That's a key sequence in the book, and sure. you know, so we, we definitely don't shy away from from those um, those issues. But you know, I'm I'm bringing to bear my personal feelings and my research. You know, nothing in my research has uh, has yielded anything to suggest definitively that there was some actual consummation of a romantic relationship. Yeah, since this is the 50th anniversary of his passing, there's there's so many reasons that we have to be grateful. That Brian Epstein, you know, entered the story. I mean, without yeah, him, yeah. we we may not we may not be here. The whole musical landscape might look very different right now if he wasn't there. Yeah. And um, so, in all of your research, apart from the personal aspect and all the struggles that he had being gay, you know, of all the accomplishments accomplishments that he made and all the ideas that he brought to the Beatles to make them the success. What surprised you the most, or what do you what do you admire him the most for in bringing and making the Beatles the success that they were? Um, you know, I, I guess it's you know uh, it's this this steadfast belief that they were going to be real artists, you know, and that when they stopped touring, you know, they could focus on really creating artwork. I mean, there is this. Um, there's this analysis that Brian was depressed after they stopped touring because there was nothing for him to do because he loved touring. And from my research, that's a load of hogwash. I mean, Brian did enjoy live theatrics and he did enjoy putting together the elements of a tour. But, you know, if you know your Beatles history, like they stopped touring at a period where things got completely out of control on the road. I mean, they went to the Philippines. They snubbed Imelda Marcos. They were chased out of the country. The Filipino army was after them. I mean, literally, Brian broke out into hives after that tour. I mean, he literally they, they were on the plane and, and it physically affected him. He, you know, uh, mm. I, from what I gleaned is like he breathed a sigh of relief to be like, we don't have to deal with that craziness anymore. 
And again, Brian from 1961 said the Beatles were going to elevate pop music into an art form. To think that there was nothing for him to do after the Beatles stopped touring was just, I mean, that's, it's ludicrous. You know, mm -hmm. the Beatles were becoming, you know, fashion icons. They were making political statements. They were, they had aspirations to, to work on records like Sgt. Pepper's. I mean, there was a lot for Brian to do. He had to clear the, every single uh, image of a famous person that was on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's. And he believed that he should do that because it was a work of art because the album artwork needed to be a work of art to support the work of art that the songs were. I mean, you know, the, 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 all those sorts of things are, are business things that he did to push forward this idea that pop musicians could be artists. I mean, you know, let's take the Beatles out of the equation. I think like, if, it, if not for Brian Epstein, you know, we might not have had the playbook that gave us One Direction or Radiohead, you know, and that's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You know, not just not just One Direction, but Radiohead. You know, Brian wrote both of those playbooks, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think that's 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 a tremendous uh, for anyone who loves music. We owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude, no matter what kind of music you listen to. Sure, yeah. Steve. Well, I, I, just to continue that thought, I think you could almost say that for almost any big name, uh, you know, uh, explosive act of the past you know 50 i guess maybe even 50 years but i'm thinking you know lady gaga any any of those the type of fame that they all had really kind of went back to what the beatles did you know i you know i i think you can cut you can link to that but anyway. yeah and even the ones that don't follow the beatles in terms of direct like sonic descendants right. you right. know it's, it's not even so much what the beatles did but what they proved you could do Right. You know, it's again this concept of hope and possibility. Like mm -hmm. the Beatles proved that there was endless possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, right. and, and, and that's what Brian really gave the world is the sense of hope and possibility. I mean, that's to, to turn it back to, to me. It's like he gave me the hope and possibility that an Indian kid didn't need to be a doctor or an engineer. You know, why, why couldn't I be a Broadway producer? Why couldn't I write graphic novels? You know, and that, that's what Brian did for me as a business person. And I think that's what the playbook of the Beatles that Brian was the architect of has done for every artist that has followed in Brian's wake, whether you're a hip hop artist or a Brit pop artist. That leads me into what I was going to ask you is for people who aren't aware of your biography, could you just give us a few of your accomplishments and your credentials so you know that what brought you into this yeah that's that's kind of you to ask you know I, I came <laughs> i came out of the music industry as i said i when i graduated college i was working for uh, mercury records division of polygram but after that i set up shop for myself and i i went into show business as as they say um and doing a lot of broadway work uh, my last two shows were Green Day's American Idiot and The Addams Family. So I was uh, one of the, the main producers of both of those shows. Before that, I produced A Raisin in the Sun, um, not the version with Denzel Washington, but the, the original, uh, broad, the first Broadway revival where we cast P. Diddy or Sean Combs, mm -hmm. the male lead. And I'm right now working with Alanis Morissette, and we're adapting uh, Jagged Little Pill for the stage. Um, really? Diablo. Oh, yeah. Wow. Mm. yeah. <laughs> I heard about that. Yeah. yeah, that's my show. That's my show. Oh, wow. so Didn't know that, that was you. Yeah. It is, yeah. Diablo Cody, um, who won the Oscar for Juno, is writing the um, the script for that. Uh, we call it a book in musical theater. Diablo's writing the book. Um, Alanis is obviously contributing the songs. She's going to write some new material for it in addition to, to all the songs from Jagged. And um, Diane Paulus, who um, is multiple Tony winner, Pippin, Waitress, Donkey Show, Porgy and Bess, is directing and Tom Kitt, who, um, who won the Pulitzer and two Tonys for Next to Normal and, and, and was the orchestrator for me for Green Day's American Idiot, is doing the orchestrations. And um, we are opening in May 2018. Uh, we're starting out of town. We're opening at ART at the American Repertory Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then uh, ah. a, bro a Broadway run will follow that. So, oh, congr yeah. Congratulations. Thank let you. Me, let me get back to uh, Brian Epstein. Um, do you personally think, and I, I realize this is kind of a dumb dumb question but i'm going to ask it anyway do you personally think the Bri the beatles could have made it without brian you know i mean this, this, these what if questions are, are always a little troublesome aren't they <laughs> but um, but i you know it, it really depends on what you mean by made it you know like I, I definitely do not think the beatles would have become the um the long lasting timeless 
international pop culture phenomenon that they became without Brian. Mm-hmm. You know, would they have succeeded as a band to some degree? Possibly. Um, you know, there, there has been, you know, some of my research and, and other folks' research has suggested that, you know, by the time Brian came along, they were really at the end of their rope. They'd been over to Hamburg. They were kicked out of the country of Germany. They had exhausted whatever little opportunities Liverpool had to offer developing artists. And they may have been considering breaking up or, or, or changing the structure of the band in some way because they weren't getting anywhere. So might they have broken up if it wasn't for Brian? Possibly. But maybe they would have figured a way to keep it together and some other manager would have come along and maybe they would have gotten as far as the boy band stuff and then they wouldn't have had somebody to create a structure that would have allowed them to experiment and that would have been successful right i mean if, if uh you know i i've, I've name checked one direction a few times you know if one direction actually has broken up and we never hear from them again they haven't achieved beatles level success but certainly they'll be remembered as a successful band of, of this decade right i mean they were successful so maybe the beatles would have achieved that degree of success maybe i'm not so sure but they certainly would not have gone on uh, to do the things that they did with Brian. And, and and we certainly, I think, would not be talking about them on this podcast now, you know, scattered over the United States. You know, uh, I just True. don't see it. I think I think at best they would have achieved a degree of success in, in the UK. They would have been Herman's Hermits. <laughs> <laughs> the question is the question is whether Herman's Hermits would have been Herman's Hermits if the Beatles hadn't been the Beatles. There you go. There you go. One, one other thing, so, uh, Vivek, you uh, in the book, you have a picture of Brian's business card that you own. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that was um, there was a gift from Nat Weiss, um, and it's a uh, it's one of my prized possessions. Um, it was just literally out of the blue. We were having dinner one night, and that said, I got something for you. And he had framed Brian's biz- uh, business card that he had of Brian's in, in a little tiny silver frame and, and gave it to me as a gift. So it's a, it's an awesome piece of memorabilia that I own it anyway. Um, but the fact that it was given to me by by Nat Weiss, who um, if anyone on the, who's listening doesn't know, Nat was the Beatles' U.S. attorney and Brian's best friend and closest confidant and, and was also gay and supported Brian with, um, you know, his, his struggles as a gay man. They were never lovers, but they were, were very, very close. So, um, so the fact that that came to me in that way is, is very meaningful. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, cool. Alan, back to you. Um, I think we are pretty much at the end of our hour, aren't we? Yes, we are. Yes, I think we, we are. are. <laughs> yeah, that went that went quick. That did. Um, that was very, great. That fun. Went very thank quick. you, guys. So, thank, thank you, you so much, Vivek. And um, how do how do people reach you if they want to? Are you on Facebook or social media? Thank you so much for asking. If, if, if I also learned anything from Brian Epstein, it's that it's plug your, your projects whenever you can. <laughs> um, so, so I will say, yes, if anyone listening would like to, to follow me or any of my projects or The Fifth Beetle, um, Fifth Beetle is online at fifthbeetle.com. We're also on Facebook and we're on Twitter at, at Fifth Beetle. And to follow Jagged Little Pill or any of my other projects, um, you can do that at tawarient.com. That's T-I-W-A-R-Y-E-N-T.com. I'm also online at Facebook, um, Vivek J. Tawari, and I'm on Twitter at, at Vivek J. Tawari, and I would love to be followed and friended, and uh, as you can probably tell, I love to talk, so um, so it's a, great, it's a great joy of mine to be in touch with people who want to know what's up. Okay, well, thanks. And um, Steve, how do people get in touch with you? Beatlesexaminer at gmail.com. You can get a hold of the show at things we said today radio show at Mm gmail.com we have a facebook page things we said today beatles radio show fans um and it's show isn't in there is it things we said today beatles radio fans thank you and uh we're also on twitter at um things we said fab uh and we want to hear from you please review the show on itunes we would love to hear your thoughts we would love to get your letters uh at our gmail account um, we'd love to hear what you like and don't like. Um, tell us, please. There we go. They have been. <laughs> they have been, yeah. They and have been. Uh, Ken? Yeah, and we've been responding to them, too. Yes, that's right. Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. I just want to point out that on my website, I have a brand new special contest, which everyone can enter to win the brand new DVD for the um, the benefit concert, Change Begins Within which took place at uh, Radio City Music Hall in 2009 with Paul and Ringo performing. Also, Cheryl Crow, Eddie Vedder, Donovan, uh, Ben Harper, a whole mess of good awesome. people. 
And uh, I was there at that show. Great show. And everybody joins forces at the end when they perform Cosmically Conscious from Paul. In a way, it's kind of cool that not only Paul and Ringo playing together, but Donovan, who was there in India with them. That's right. (laughs) You know? So, uh, yeah. So there's a brand new special contest there. And I also just did a new interview with Bruce Spizer, who was a guest on our show. Uh, which you can check out as well. But we talk about his new book, which is um, The Beatles and Sgt. Pepper, A Fan's Perspective. Some of the same questions that we we brought up here and some ones that we didn't. And that's on my interviews page four uh, page on my website. So again, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. And you can get a hold of me on Facebook (laughs) (laughs) either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And, uh, yeah, that's the way to do it. Okay, so for Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci and our special guest this week, Vivek J. Tuari, this is Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.